Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to both our in-person and online worship service here at Hammond Street Congregational Church, where whoever you are or wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcomed here. We're glad you can be with us either through technology or in person. It's wonderful to be together to offer God thanks and praise. One announcement uh, as we continue, I want you to keep an eye on Holy Week because we have a number of things happening on Holy Week. The Saturday before Palm Sunday, we will be passing out Holy Week kits. On Palm Sunday, we will have the dedication of the palms and you'll have yours at home. And so you'll be able to participate. Also, we will be doing in person, Good Friday, so that will be here at the church on Good Friday at 7 o'clock. But the Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Easter Sunday will be online. The reason for Palm Sunday and Easter to be online is simply because so many people would want to be here, and the thought of disappointing so many just didn't make sense to us. So we will do Palm Sunday and Easter online. However, uh, our plan and our hope is to have an outside sunrise service where those who would like to gather on Easter Sunday would be able to do that. So you'll be getting more information. Watch your Hammond Streeter and also look for other communication about all of those events. But it is good to have you here today as we continue with our Lenten journey. And we do so by lighting our next Lenten candle. Good morning. We are not Carolyn and Kathy. It's Brad and Linda for those who don't know. Um, they were not able to make it this morning. On this third Sunday in Lent, many of us are thirsting for love and comfort. Some of us are feeling abandoned by those who care, those we care about most. We hunger for a phone call, a hug, or a kind word. Things can be different. It's not too late. Jesus showed us that God's nourishing love is around us, even in the most difficult circumstances. We give thanks for the hunger and thirst that compels us to eat and drink until we are satisfied. If you'd all join us. Oh God, we, we hunger and thirst for you. Help us to have compassionate towards to share this need. Give, give us the courage to be like gardeners, offering our gifts to help our hearts grow. Amen. Amen. But I invite all who are able to rise in body and spirit for our responsive call to worship. <clears throat> Called by Christ, 
we gather as one. Blessed by God's wisdom, we gather to learn. Amazed by God's love, we gather to worship.
Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Anybody who can sing before noon is good. <laughs> we now come to that, that time in our service that we intentionally set aside for prayer. So we're going to continue with a tradition we started a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to do a bidding prayer where I will give you an area in which to pray about and give you some time to pray in the silence of your heart, knowing that the God who created you knows what you need and what you are saying before you even utter a syllable out loud. So let us now come together in that spirit of prayer and let us begin by praying for our world leaders that they might have a bit of God's wisdom that helps lead us to a world of peace and a world of justice. Gracious God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Hear us now as we pray for our nation's leaders, that they might find a way of bridging divides that bring us together. Gracious God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Hear us now, O oh God, as we pray for the church, the church universal and also this particular congregation. May they be led to embrace the call of Christ and embody Christ's ministry in their ministry. Gracious God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us now, O God, as we pray for those who are in need of healing and wholeness. They, may they be touched by the warmth of your love and find a wholeness that only you can offer. Hear us as we name them in our hearts now. Gracious God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And hear us as we pray for ourselves, that we might find ways to be the disciples you call us to be. Gracious God, in your mercy, hear our prayers, and hear us now as we bring our diverse hearts and voices together as one in Christ, and lift up to you the words of the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. Jesus cleanses the temple. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> All in favor of getting a zip line to get Lori from the back to the front more <laughs> quickly, say aye. Aye. <laughs> Would make it a little more interesting. I do want to thank the leaders of the church for allowing us to come back in for worship. Um, after four months, I guess they felt they'd tried me out long enough where it was okay to let me out in public. <laughs> so it is good to have you here. But I was thinking today, you know, Jesus never would have lasted as a pastor. <laughs> I look at what happened when he came into his community of faith. He had a little righteous anger. He challenged some things they had done forever. And I can picture somebody taking Jesus aside and saying, now, now Jesus, yeah, first of all, you haven't been here in a while. You're an outsider. You know, you got to take it easy when you're an outsider. You know, we know ourselves pretty well and we know what we need to do. You just need to kind of relax, take it easy, and... You know, you just can't come in and change things overnight. That just don't, doesn't work. I mean, did you not get the memo? We've always done it that way. <laughs> no, Jesus never would have lasted. 
Because when we are challenged, particularly in the way that he challenged people, we don't like it. It's hard to look at what we've been doing and have someone say, we need to do it differently. And that's particularly true in the church. I remember I was in one congregation, not this one, and there was a newer member in the kitchen. And the person suggested to those who were working there, you know, maybe we could put the utensils in this drawer instead of this one. That member was never seen again. <laughs> we don't like change. We're used to what we do. It's comfortable. It, we believe it fits for us. So when someone comes in and says, do it differently, we don't want to hear. And it's particularly hard to hear Jesus in today's reading because Jesus isn't talking to those outsiders. He isn't talking to the leaders of the world about peace and justice. He's challenging the community of faith. And he was challenging them in regards to what they were doing that they had just taken for granted. I mean, he struggled with the idea that people had to come in and purchase animals for sacrifice so that they could worship God. And that some were probably making a profit because a lot of these people who came were the outsiders, you know, those who hadn't joined the church yet. And they had coins that they normally used to pay for things, but they had the image of Caesar on them. And in the temple, you could not use coins with such an image on it. So they had to change those out for coins that had no image on them. And some people were making a profit on that. Jesus' anger, if we look beneath it, really raises the issues that I believe the church always needs to look at. Because he was angry. He was angry because he believed that they had desecrated God's house. That they had debased worship and that they had substituted ritual for devotion. Jesus was angry that the things that they were doing were keeping folks from developing that relationship with God and being able to worship God. And so he said, if this does not change, the temple can go away and it will be raised up again and it will become the body of Christ. We don't like to hear that. But we have to put his words in some context. You see, I don't think Jesus was saying that the faith community was intentionally trying to keep people from worshiping or praising God or developing their faith or having a devotional life. It's just a way that they had come to do things that just had been put in place and had been used time and time again. They became comfortable with it because that's the way we do it. So Jesus was challenging all of us to look at how we do what we do and why. I also, some would say, see, this is Jesus challenging the institution of the church. I don't think so. That's that old argument of spirituality versus religion, when actually, ironically, they're two sides of the same coin. Jesus isn't saying institutions are bad. He never challenged that. What he was challenging is that the institution may not have been fulfilling its call. So he wanted to get their attention. And he did. We are part of a tradition of the Reformation. Our congregation is 
steeped in that tradition. Although I must admit for some they believe the Reformation stopped with Luther and Calvin. Others, they're a little more progressive, might say, well, it stopped in the 1950s. And we try to hold on to what has been. Not that what was is bad, or it might not even still be bad, but we just don't think about it. We forget that reforming the church is something that isn't a one-time event. It's something that is continual. It goes on and on because we learn more about God's word and our world changes. Just look in your pocket or in your purse. And take out that smartphone, probably not during the sermon. <laughs> but you'll think about the power that's in that cell phone. That kind of computer power in the past would not have fit in this building. The world changes, and God calls us to respond to those changes. So, reformation needs to be continual. And also we remember that sometimes the best transformation and reformation comes because of outsiders. In Maine, we call them people from away. <laughs> because sometimes they can see what we cannot see. And they can offer to us a different perspective. I've certainly learned that as an individual. And actually, I learned that from someone else, an outsider. I remember one time I was talking to one of your former members who has sadly passed away, but Nelson Durgan. And we were talking. And he was saying, Joe, when you present ideas in a meeting, you're very passionate about it. And I said, well, yes, I wouldn't present it if I weren't excited. He said, well, Joe, you might not notice. But sometimes your passion communicates, don't tell me no. <laughs> and he said, I know you. I know that isn't what you're trying to say. But that's what's being heard. So I learned from him because we set up a system. If I started getting too passionate, he would kick me under the table. <laughs> and yes, I have bruises. <laughs> but it was because of an outside perspective that I learned. I became a better writer because of folks proofing what I wrote. And you all can tell when I haven't made use of that. <laughs> My wife will tell you, but she proofreads and she has taught me and now the greatest joy of my life is when I give her something and she says, there's nothing to change. <laughs> we can learn from outsiders even in the church. I believe that Lent and a congregation who's living through an interim time, an in-between time between the pastor who was here and the pastor who is yet to come. It's a wonderful time to reflect. And God calls us during Lent to reflect upon our faithfulness to God's covenant with us. And we need to take this time and do that reflection and look at what we do, why we do it, and does it fit with who God has called us to be. And as we go through a process of reflection, we do need to talk not only amongst ourselves, but we need to talk to folks out there because they can help us to learn. I remember a few times I have brought people into a church building 
to walk through it, look around. They're not members. They've never seen the building before. And to offer their reflections. What does the building say to you? How does the building look to you? And a lot of times what we have found out is from outsiders, well, this could be neatened up a little bit, or this is a really confusing building to find your way around, and there are no signs and no maps. The members of the church who heard this would often go, really? I can find this without thinking about it. Well, that's like telling people they live next to the old McDonald's house. If you haven't been here, you don't know. So the idea is we need to bring in outsiders, hear their perspectives, hear their needs that we might not be addressing, but we could. We need to ask the hard questions. We need to say, are the things that we do in worship being done because we've always done it that way? Or are they speaking to praising God, worshiping God, showing adoration to God, fueling people's sense of faith? We have to be honest about those because some things we slide into and they become habit. They become rituals, but they become sort of, well, I don't know why we do that. We just always do that. Sort of like there's this old story about a woman who was trying to make a roast like her mother did. And she noticed her mother always cut off each end of the roast before she put it in the pot. And she just automatically did that. She didn't know why. She just, well, that's what mom did. And she finally asked her mother, why did you cut off the ends of the roast? And she said the pan was too small. <laughs> Sometimes we do things without thinking them through, particularly in worship. So we need to take the time and ask those hard questions. We need to ask the hard questions like when we say we want new leaders, we want to empower people to use their gifts in the church. Do we really let them lead? Or do we say, yes, you can be a leader, but here's the instructions on how to do it. And we can play music to it. <laughs> Might make it more palatable. But sometimes we say we want other people to lead, but yet we don't let go enough to let them lead. We need to ask the question, are we doing that? Churches also need to answer the question, are we living out our identity? I have been a, in a lot of churches over the years that have been open and affirming, and they say, whoever you are, wherever you are in life's journey, you are welcomed here. Uh, well, but if you're at that end of the theological spectrum, no, you probably don't want to be here. And I know that for 35 years I've been convincing those churches, you can let a guy pastor you who doesn't have 20-20 vision. <laughs> Are we really open to all, or do we take a slice of the theological spectrum and say, that's the only ones welcomed here? Or are there really certain kinds of people we want? We have to ask the question and be honest with ourselves. That's what God wants us to do, to be honest so that we can be the church we are called to be. It is my prayer during Lent and during your interim time, you will ask those tough questions. You will look at where Jesus might be wanting tables to turn over and certain things to be, I'm going to say this in church, changed. <laughs> and it will be hard. We will get mad back. 
at those who suggest those changes. That's all right. That begins a dialogue. But the idea is, Jesus was challenging the community of faith to be who they were called to be and not put things in the way of living out that identity. Let us turn over a few tables. Let us make the changes we feel called to make, not just for the sake of change, but because they have meaning. And let us look for that reformation. Let us be the reforming church of Jesus Christ that wants to live out and embody the ministry of Jesus in our lives together as a community of faith. And then we will truly know the joy of new life. Amen. forevermore. Amen.